I'm Felice Scare, director of AJC's Jacob Blaustein Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights. This year, our institute marks its 50th anniversary. And on this occasion, we recognize the lifelong human rights contributions of Dr. Ahmed Shaheed, currently the United Nations Independent Expert on Freedom of Religion or Belief, its special rapporteur. Earlier, he was UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran, and before that, Foreign Minister of the Maldives. As Foreign Minister, he led the Maldives to embrace universal human rights standards, and he, led, and he tried to establish contacts between his country and Israel. And he was appointed by the United Nations as Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran. But when hardline Islamists came into power, threatening him, as they had done before he seized power, he went into exile. From a base at the University of Essex in England, Dr. Shahid continued his work as the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran. He mobilized diaspora victims and human rights groups to help him monitor and report on Iran's actions in detail. Dr. Shahid has strived to ensure that whenever human rights are under threat, there is an effective international response. Like the Jacob Blaustein Institute, Dr. Shahid has sought to protect everyone's rights, not solely the rights of those who share his religion or nationality. As special rapporteur on freedom of religion, he published the UN's first standalone report on global anti-Semitism in 2019. AJC called that report historic, and it truly is. Dr. Shahid, we deeply appreciate your personal courage and conviction, and especially we recognize your role as an effective and courageous advocate for universal human rights. Good afternoon, Director Gaia. Delighted to see you again. And thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this historic commemoration of the Jacob Blaustein Institute. Let me extend to you and your colleagues and all those associated with JBI, warm felicitations on reaching this historic milestone with such an impressive track record. You and JBI have made exemplary contributions to advancing human rights through the UN, especially in strengthening the effectiveness of the UN's human rights mechanisms. Your own personal contribution, not just through the JBI, but in your own capacity, as member of the UN Committee Against Torture and other roles is not only legendary, but a source of inspiration for everyone. I'm humbled and honored to be invited to you to join you at this global forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. You know, since 2016, you've been in the role of Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. In this role, you recognize the unique power of international human rights standards and mechanisms that we at JBI have tried to build at the United Nations. As rapporteur, you've been an advocate for the rights of religious minorities. And you have also confronted the challenges faced by rights holders who have not previously received much attention, including women, non-believers, LGBTQ people, and others. Can you tell us what has motivated you to take this extraordinarily inclusive approach to the issue? Well, human rights are universal. An inclusive approach to human rights is therefore not an option. It is the only approach consistent with the underlying principles of human rights. If we overlook those in the most vulnerable situations, we lose the essential character of human rights as rights, and they become privileges for the few. My UN mandate is very broad covering the freedom of thought, conscience and religion or belief. And these freedoms apply equally to everyone, regardless of race, religion, nationality, gender, or other characteristic. Trends in globalization, increase in diversity of our communities, rising intolerance both online and offline, show that it is minorities and dissenters and others who may be in a vulnerable situation who most frequently face rights violations. And if the human rights framework cannot defend the rights of the most vulnerable, it would lack legitimacy and credibility. And while, of course, organized religions have made enormous contributions to all aspects of our life, 
they are often embedded, there are often embedded biases and prejudices which become expressed as harmful practices towards women, girls, and LGBT plus persons. And of course, as the preamble oh. to the Universal Human Rights Declaration states in its opening line, that the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world is a recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of every member of the human family. These insights clearly call for an inclusive approach. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. You know, in your report on global anti-Semitism, you implored governments to recognize what AJC and the Jacob Lawson Institute have been saying, that anti-Semitism was rising around the world and is a serious human rights concern. You said anti-Semitism threatens not only Jews, but the foundations of democratic societies. You asked governments to adopt the uh, IRA working definition on anti-Semitism, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association definition. And you recognize the danger of anti-Semitism in a way that none of your UN predecessors did. And you called on governments, companies, and even the United Nations to do more to fight anti-Semitism. Can you tell us why you felt it was necessary to sound the alarm about anti-Semitism? And in the fight against anti-Semitism, what changes do you seek at the United Nations itself to make it a reliable ally rather than as it is so frequently an antagonist? I found a serious lack of attention to rights violations faced by Jewish communities in the work of my UN mandate. It is very strange given the fact that one of the key features of the rising religious and racial hatred globally is violence against Jews. The number of attacks targeting Jews is not only heartbreaking, but disproportionately high. And this required a response. Antisemitism is often propagated by influential political leaders. It is the oldest form of religious hatred. It is global. It occurs across the entire political spectrum and it is growing. And although it takes many forms, at its core is a conspiracy theory, a scapegoating, a dehumanization, in themselves egregious and highly destructive of democracy. Of course, parts of the UN fanned the flames of this intolerance. Reforms are needed to ensure that Israel is not treated any differently to other states, and to seek Israel's cooperation by focusing on the constructive universal theoretical process, which highlights the cooperative character of the UN system, and also that all states are equally accountable to a global common standard. Human rights is not a zero sum political game. Some parts of the UN less open to political abuses are already playing helpful roles. My report called on the UN Secretariat to take the lead in combating anti-Semitism through education, awareness raising, promoting peer-to-peer -peer learning, and to use the IHRA working definition as you referred to just now as a non-legal tool to combat anti-Semitism as a global human rights challenge and not to regard anti-Semitism as a threat to Jews alone. And on this subject, I do want to thank you and JBI and other members of the various Jewish communities worldwide for your cooperation while I worked on my UN report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahir. Uh, you know, from 2011 to 2016, you served as the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran, as I mentioned. You produced groundbreaking reports that ensured that the world knew the truth about the crackdown after the 2009 elections and other repression facing the Iranian people, even as the government engaged in a vicious campaign of harassment and threats against you personally. What can you tell us about the state of human rights in Iran today from your perspective as Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion. And have you seen any changes in the government's approach to this issue? I'm afraid things haven't improved. My current work concerns a number of serious human rights issues in Iran, including the use of the state machinery to enforce discriminatory religious teachings, especially those that violate the human rights of women, children, religious minorities, and LGBT persons, as well as the right to life, among others. Iran is possibly the clearest example of how a country of great promise can be ruined by religious intolerance and disregard for human rights. Such intolerance, of course, does not spare the majority Shia community either, where dissent is punished. But the present time I'm particularly concerned about the plight of the Baha'i community 
who are facing systematic persecution, possibly designed to destroy their presence in the country. And this persecution has now extended to other countries where Iran has some influence. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. Uh, you know, democracy and human rights are being challenged in many parts of the world today. What, what do you see as the future of human rights as it's confronted by radicalism, populism, and, and cynicism about the capacity of international institutions to combat these dark forces and to protect people? Even before the pandemic, people have been talking about backsliding on human rights across many indicators, linked to the rise of new powers without a robust commitment to human rights, the election of populist leaders, and mainstreaming of far-right groups. The pandemic has in many ways accentuated these trends, and we can think of the lurking danger of climate change and the rising threats from new technologies. But even in some of the darkest moments in the past decade, it has always been clear that we've been through darker times. The lessons learned remain valid, including on what it takes to fight back against hatred. Many of us stress the power of people, of solidarity, of mobilization, of coalition building, of investing in children and youth, and of using all means available for the good. I draw hope from the fact that more children are in schools today than ever before, more legal protections are offered to the LGBT persons than ever before, and more people can get online. I have seen my own mandate help people. I've seen the power of UN human rights mechanisms to protect victims of abuse that need it and have few other means of support. These protect people around the world. In terms of my own work, by no means am I finished raising the issue of anti-Semitism as a human rights concern with the UN. I have raised it in the General Assembly two years back, and now I will go to the Human Rights Council and present an action plan on how to combat anti-Semitism before my mandate is up next year. I shall, of course, work on this well beyond my UN tenure. As I have said before, Felice, none of us is safe until all of us are safe. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. That's been something uh, Jacob Blaustein and the American Jewish Committee have stood for for many, many years. You really uh, hearten us with that news of your plans uh, for the future to stay with this issue. And Dr. Shahid, you have been a game changer at the UN and in the human rights field. You've already accomplished things that few thought would be possible. On behalf of uh, the American Jewish Committee's Jacob Blaustein Institute, uh, we are so grateful to have you as a partner and an ally in the fight against anti-Semitism and in the defense for human rights for all people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Felice. I look forward to working with you and your colleagues. Thank you.